Ladies and gentlemen of the West Alabama area, the Tuscaloosa Farmers Co-op located in Northport, Alabama has over 70 years of experience in feed, seed, and other gardening needs. If you guys are interested in picking up a couple of plants, flowers, or other gardening needs, as well as feed for livestock, then you need to check out the Tuscaloosa Farmers Co-op page on Facebook for all of the latest deals that they have going on, and their newest inventory is the Next Level Golf Cart to make all of your neighbors envious, and those are street legal as well. You can find Tuscaloosa Farmers Co-op on four. 4301 McFarland Boulevard over there in Northport, just west of the Highway 43 and 82 intersection. Go by and check out the Tuscaloosa Farmers Co-op for all of your farming needs. That was an unusual year and just a really strange situation to say the least. And yeah, uh, but but great place. Enjoyed my time there. Loved the people there, and uh, was uh, not particularly excited to have to move on but uh but that happens in a business so here i am in tulsa with kevin wilson who's a good man a good coach yes sir well we'll make it fast and we'll get rolling because we know yep. your time is delicate um with that uh we're a storytelling show we cut up we're an sec show feel cool. free to tell any story if you want to get long-winded go for it if you <laughs> accidentally slip up and say a four-letter word we can edit it out if you start yes. an answer and you think of another detail and want to start over, just let us know. You can do that. We can edit that out too. And okay. we just want you to have fun. Okay. So Outstanding. We want you to be the funniest and smartest guy in the room. And Dan Mellon asks if he could be the handsomest. And we're like, sure, Dan. All right. Put him in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. So, Quick. Heath, since you got this uh, guest and got it going, uh, do you want to do the open to the show? Sure. Are we more okay. happy to welcome Tuscaloosa and SEC fans. You're listening to the Stingray Show here with Stephen Ray and Heath Hopkins. Today we have a very special guest. He's been all over the SEC. His name is Royalty, but we're going to stay more on him. And he's got a bunch of children. He knows everything about X's and O's in the SEC, and he's got plenty of stories. Check it out next here on the Stingray Show with Heath Hopkins and Stephen Ray on Todd 100.9. Hi, this is Tim Brando with a reminder. Those of you on Todd 100.9, Look out, you're about to feel the buzz of Stingray. This is Stephen Ray, a.k.a. Stingray, coming to you live from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I'm Heath Hopkins. I'm here in DeSoto County, Mississippi, right outside of Memphis, Tennessee. I don't know if you want me to get mad. I don't know if you want me to get mean. I don't know if you want me to get rowdy. But that's what I'm about to do. First defense ever. We are Mississippi State. Fear the bells! How many chicken wings you eat in a city? And you just look, ballpark it. Four. What? Four chicken wings, my. And Heath, any thoughts on our show moving forward? Hey, to everyone in Tuscaloosa listening here on Tide 100.9. With the Stingray Show, if you don't like it, you better learn to love it. Because it's the best show going today, baby. Woo! Summertime is the perfect time to start building the pond or lake of your dreams. Or, if you need to decide if property you own or thinking about buying is a good location to build a pond, then you need to contact Jeff Bagwell of Honey Hole Fisheries right here in Tuscaloosa. He also has top quality automatic fish feeders, aeration systems, and fountains if you already have a lake. You can contact Honey Hole Fisheries and Jeff Jeff Bagwell at 205-799-0192. Once again, that is 205-799-0192. Or check out HoneyHoleFisheries.com. Contact Jeff Bagwell today to let him grow the lake or pond of your dreams. Heath, thank you so much for uh, opening the show because I will give you props. You were able to get this guest here. And so for that, I want to say thank you and welcome inside another edition of the Stingray Show. Well, I appreciate that, Stephen. I had to put my old media credentials back from my television day back to use. Yes. Uh, of being a reporter and an anchor and a sports director. But yeah, it's always fun to reach out. And I'm, I'm always excited to get coaches on the show, oh, but yes. I'm always 
excited to get current coaches. And uh, I've heard this guy's got some fun stories, and I'm looking forward to asking him. He's a new guest, and I always appreciate the new guests that come on. Yes. His name is Steve Spurrier Jr., and he has coached in 22 postseason bowl games, including the Sugar Bowl, the Fiesta Bowl, the Cotton Bowl, and the Orange Bowl. He also was a part of five Mm. conference championships, which includes three in the SEC and two in the Big 12. Oh, and here are the biggest things, two national championships, one with Oklahoma in 2000, and the other one was with Florida in 1996. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest this evening on the Stingray Show, Steve Spurrier, Jr., Coach Spurrier, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing well. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate the introduction. Yeah, that's a bunch of bowl games. That's a lot of years right there. Yes. Uh, but yeah, I've been, been very fortunate, been blessed to be around a lot of great people and a lot of great programs and uh, and always excited to get on with you guys and see some Hale State people and see yes. Heath and you guys. And uh, always a good day. Thank you. Appreciate that, Coach. Yes, coach, sir. a fun question. What do you do with all those bowl rings? Uh, when's the last time you even wore one? Uh, you know what? I try to wear them when I recruit. When you out recruiting, right? And, you know they get a little bigger and a little flashier, and you get kids' attention. Um, so uh, yeah, the coach Leach was big on bowl games. Uh, even if we didn't win them, he was getting a ring. He was getting a ring, and he was stacking them up. So we always had a, a bunch of them. And I'm always amazed every single year. We had one year at Mississippi State, went to a bowl game, and uh, and the ring we got was bigger than the national championship from Oklahoma in, in 2000. It's twice the size. Yes. So, yeah, rings are bigger and shinier and sparklier, and uh, and I'm fortunate to have some of them and, and with some really good teams and really good coaches. Now, are, are you a big bling guy? Do you, do you wear the gold chain and everything, or is it just for recruiting? Yeah, no, just for recruiting. They're, they're kind of heavy. I, I wear an Apple Watch. That's about it. I, yeah, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't have a lot of tattoos or necklaces. I'm a pretty simple guy. Gotcha. <laughs> so, Coach, you played wide receiver at Duke from 1989 through 1993. Please tell us some of your most fondest memories playing up there at Duke. Well, I uh, I kind of claim North Carolina as my home. It was the longest I ever lived anywhere. I was born in okay. California, lived in Florida, Georgia, North Carolina. My father went back and forth and back and forth a bunch of places. Um, so when I, I started um, – high school as a sophomore and then my father uh, took the Florida job in that 89 90 year yes. and I started at Duke then so I lived seven years in a row in one place that's the longest I ever lived anywhere um, but yeah it was a great place great school great program uh, had a lot of good memories um, Duke went to a bowl game the year before I got there and the year after I left so uh, necessarily on the field wasn't uh, the greatest years at Duke University but great place great program great friends a lot of really good memories. Um, I just had two sons graduate from there last month. Uh, oh, so, yeah, so Duke holds certainly a special place in my heart. Um, and in my father's. My father twice mentioned, you know, there were two times in my career I didn't have a job where Duke hired me. Yes. And uh, he'll always remember those guys for bringing him in. He was the OC, 80, 81, 82, and the head coach, 87, 88, 89. And, um, and he certainly has a lot of great memories uh, of that school and that program. Yes. Wow. Now, Coach, uh, it's Father's Day coming up here this weekend, and let's tell everybody, how many kids do you have and give us their ages? I own seven children, uh, only four pregnancies, and then I like to try to challenge people to do the math on that. (laughs) Four pregnancies, seven children, no adoptions, all the same mother, uh, seven of them. So I opened up with triplets. I have 22-year-old triplets. I have a 16-year-old. I have twin 12-year-olds. Uh, and an eight-year-old uh, little girl. And if I had quads, the last time, I could have hit for the cycle. And that's never been done before. And I could have gotten my own TV show. And that that's you know, that's that could have been the real excitement in life. So three, one, two, one, uh, blessed, happy, healthy, eat well, sleep well. And uh, very, very fortunate that they're all doing good. So after I had six, and um, at the time we had five boys and a girl, and my wife said, I want to have another one. I'll, I'd like to have another girl. I'm like, yeah, it doesn't work that way. I mean, we're we're going to have twin boys again. Yeah, this just doesn't make any sense at all. I don't think this is a good idea. So she said she's having another one. I said, well, hopefully it's with me. So we got five boys and two girls, and uh, and, and they're all doing great. 
No, what do the multiples kind of pick up on the on the singles? They're, they're you're like, oh, you're not really part of us. You're, you're by yourself. <laughs> I mean, it, they, they've all been good. Uh, they've all kind of in and out. And they take care of everybody. And um, they, the single in the middle, the 16 year old, he's kind of caught in between both both worlds. He wants to hang out with the older kids. And they're, yeah, he came hang out with us. And he's stuck at the little table with a 12 year old dad. I don't like that too much. So, uh, but other than that, no, they, they do well, get along well. And, uh, and we are, we're, we're pretty fortunate. So, you. coach, you, you know, you coached at a bunch of different places. However, you coached in college and the NFL. You coached first off wide receivers at Oklahoma and then moved to the Washington Redskins where you were the wide receivers coach as well. Can you please kind of talk to us about the difference between going from college to the NFL and the differences of coaching styles? Um, it's, it's amazingly different and it's a lot, it's a lot different than you'd like to think it would be. Um, and, but it was kind of neat. It was a neat experience. It was, you know, everything with the Redskins was unique in a lot of different ways. Um, in college, and all colleges are kind of different. And, and if you coach at a really good college, to me, that's, that's I should say, easier than coaching the NFL. And the NFL is oh, absolutely. 32 of the best teams in the world. In college, if you've got a good job, you can out-recruit the majority of people that you recruit against. Right. Uh, you should have better talent than the majority of people that you play against. So when I came from Oklahoma and we had a lot of good players and recruited a lot of players and you recruit the best players and you get who you get. Sometimes you'll get a taller guy or a faster guy. And, you know, you just go play with what you go play with. So when I got to the Redskins, our first year there, uh, the next year that going into the draft, they said, listen, we're going to take a receiver in the first round. I said, okay, that's awesome. So they're like, listen, you need to evaluate every single that's going to be drafted. We'll give you a list of about 30 guys, evaluate them all, rank them all, sort them all, figure it out. And then we're going to have a draft meeting and go from there. I'm like, okay, great. So I, I evaluate all these guys. About a week later, I go in there and I meet with everyone, general manager, owner, director of recruiting, director of player personnel, all the scouts from every different area. And they said, okay, we're listening. We're taking a uh, wide receiver uh, with the seventh pick in the first round. What kind of receiver are you looking for? Best one I can find. <laughs> they said, well, how tall? How tall you want him to be? And I, I really didn't know how. Uh, how, well, how much you want him to weigh? I, I really didn't know. They said, how fast do you want him to be? I said, the fastest guy we can find. Right. Yeah, God, let's, let's go get him. And um, and they're like, no, we we have to. It's a particular guy we're looking for. And, and let's let's find out what that is. You know, where is he going to play? Is he a slot guy? Is he an outside guy? Is he this? Is he that? Um, so we, we literally narrowed down to a guy that's 5'10 to 6'1", uh, 185 pounds to 205. And a four three eight to four four three guy. I mean, th- that we were looking for that guy. So wow. now you go through your list and you sort through and you cut through. So the guy we decided to take was Peerless Price from Tennessee, right. he, and he's that guy. And he's a great player. I, I thought he was awesome. I said, okay. So we go into draft and I, I'm, okay, let's here we go. And I, you know, it's thirty or forty five minutes between each pick. So sure enough, we get to the sixth pick, and the New Orleans Saints. So like peerless price for the six pick and we're on the clock. <laughs> so I'll, I'll never forget that. I thought that was, uh, I thought that was kind of crazy. So we worked our way through the draft day and then we ended up in free agency signing Lavernius Colts. Yeah. Was six feet, 200 pounds, four, three, nine guy that, that was that guy, which was really a good player for us. But, um, and then coaching was different too. When you, um, and I remember Marvin Lewis was our defensive coordinator and Hugh Jackson was our running back coach. So hmm. it was a, I mean, it was neat just listening to those guys who'd been around the game and been around the NFL, and it was, and listening to what, how you coach and how you teach and how you motivate and, and and kind of what you do with your players and and the guys you have, you coach the guys you have, and if you're looking for something different, then you go find a different type of player in free agency. But the guys you have uh, that are making a lot of money, we they're making a lot of money because of their exact skill set, and mm-hmm. we will coach and run our program and run our offense based on who that guy is not based on what you think is best. And I always thought that was kind of neat. You know, in college, you, you, you do your best to get the best players you can, you can right. get and you put them in your system and you go full speed. So um, it was neat. It was a neat couple of years and just the experiences and the places you go and the, you know, the NFL the cities you go to was, was really a cool experience. Yes, Quick follow-up to that. You talked about motivating. What's the difference of motivating a college player and an NFL player? 
Well, college player, you tell them if he doesn't go do it your way, if you throw him out, right? <laughs> I'll go get another one. And and again, I'll never forget. You know, in college, you have 12, 13 receivers. You know, we right. had a bunch of receivers. So you and and you develop guys. You know, mm-hmm. we got some young guys. Your, your day's not today. I'm going to keep coaching you. And next year and the year after that, you're going to be a really good player for us. In the NFL, you know, there's five guys in your room, and um, and all five of them have to be really good today. And I do. I remember I had a meeting with um, with one of the coaches and, you know, we were trying to figure out, are we going to take this guy or that guy? And uh, and they and they said, what do you think about this guy? I'm like, I really like this guy. And this guy, you know, he's he's got a kind of a, he's got some stuff to learn and some development to do. But I think he will be a, a great player uh, next year, or the year after that. And the coach looked at me and said, now, listen, he said, if that guy can't go on the field today and win football games, you will get fired before he gets cut. Wow. Wow. So there you have it. So we cut him. We cut him and we, right. we kept another guy that had a little bit more special teams value. Uh, mm-hmm. And then, I, you know, I had the, the four guys that I thought were the greatest players that day. So that, 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 uh, and uh, you know, you don't think about that, but you, yes, you have to put together a team that can, can win today uh, in hey, the NFL. Coach, another quick short follow up. I heard this years ago and it might be old uh, now. The NFL may not use it. But I always heard when it comes to the draft, you draft the next available best guy, no matter the position. You go out and sign what you need. Right. Is that right. True? Um, it is uh, the, the you have there's different boards in the NFL. Mm-hmm. And one of them is based on what your needs are. And one of them is based on who's the most talented is. And uh, they actually I'll never forget. There was a guy. They had a sheet of paper and it they put a value on every single draft pick. And it's a historic value on this pick at this level played this amount. was So there's a value for all of them. Mm-hmm. And they start to talk about, so your best available versus your greatest need. Uh, there's usually a number that they put on those guys to decide which decision they make. Um, wow. And it can go either way. But, yeah, if there's a, if there's a great player available, uh, you'll, you'll take him before a particular need sometime. That's correct. You think that system's correct? Do you think it's – it works is what I'm saying. Well, who knows, you know, and, and there's yeah. so many teams every single year and it's amount, um, the amount of time and money and effort they put in evaluating college prospects. They still make mistakes every year. Mm-hmm. And uh, I do remember we talked to one NFL head coach and he had the uh, he had the second pick in the NFL draft. And he said every single person really knows approximately who eight of the top 10 picks are in the first round. I mean, eight of the top 10, about everybody agrees on. And he said, of those eight guys. Two of them are complete busts. So he said, we, we, we spend more time trying to find out who the two busts are. He said, because, <laughs> yeah, the other guys, if you get one of those six guys, you're going you're gonna to do really well. But if you get one of the two busts, and that's what – it was interesting how he identified it. So it, it is funny when you talk to scouts and NFL, you know, they're, they're, looking, they're looking for a reason not to take you. Like, this guy might have a problem. Who is yes. <laughs> So it, especially when you take a big pick, you, you got to make sure you don't make a mistake at that level. Mm-hmm. So our guest this evening is Steve Spurrier, Jr., uh, the coach right now, the wide receivers coach up there at Tulsa. And coach- Actually, I'm the quarterback coach up here. Gotcha. There you go. You'd be coach great, OB. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, okay. excited about that. So before you got to the Washington Redskins, you had a very you had a stint there with Oklahoma. And it was, you know, you've had two but this was the first one. Talk about your relationship and your experience there and what you learned from Coach Bob Stoops. Yeah, Coach uh, Stoops was my father's defense coordinator at Florida. Yes. So I was a GA 95 and 67. Um, so when he got the job in Oklahoma, he offered me the job to come up there, and it was awesome. And then Mike Leach was the offense coordinator mm-hmm. the first year there in 99. So that was my tie to Mike Leach. And then he got the head coach at Texas Tech the next year. Um, and then Mark Mangino was the offense coordinator the next year. And then he got the head coaching job at Kansas. Mm-hmm. And then Kevin Wilson was actually hired as the offense coordinator. So that's where I met Kevin Wilson and crossed paths with him. Um, yeah, Bob Bob Stoops is is and continues to be one of the, one of the greatest out there. Um, I, I've spent I've spent I coached with him for four years, and um, yeah, everything he did and how he ran his program and how he led his team and how he was a father and a parent and a husband and everything he did was always such a, just a great person to be around. And, 
And, you know, when we when he took the job at Oklahoma, Oklahoma had not been to a bowl game in five years. Mm. Um, so the first year we had a lead in every game we played, I think we finished seven and five. And then the next year we went 13-0, and won the national championship. Um, so that was kind of a remarkable remarkable thing to be a part of it, it really was because nobody knew what to expect from Oklahoma the, the history was obviously amazing but the recent history wasn't very good um, but we had some good players we had a good team uh, coach brought a lot of good coaches with him uh, from Kansas State that came down with him Brent Venables was the linebacker coach um, so it was really I mean really an awesome time to be a part of Oklahoma and be a part of the history that was made that year and yeah and the coach is one of the best without a doubt Yes, sir. Well, on that note, we are up against our first break, and when we come back, we are going to continue the interview with Steve Spurrier, Jr. That's on the other side of the break. You're listening to the Stingray Show right here on Tide 100.9. Summertime is here, folks, and that means cookouts at the lake, at the pool, summer barbecues, and you need to stop in and see my friends at South's Finest Meats. They have a wide variety of meats, fruits, and vegetables, including pork ribs, butts, fresh ground hamburgers made daily, lots of varieties of smoked sausage, everybody loves sausage, fresh hand-cut steaks, and chicken. You can check them out at 3201 10th Avenue or their Cottondale location at 64. 405 University Boulevard East. They are definitely looking forward to serving you. Welcome back inside the Stingray Show right here on Tide 100.9. Hope all is well with you and guys. Our guest this evening is none other than Steve Spurrier Jr., the quarterback's coach this year up at Tulsa. And before you got there, coach, You had a very short stint with Mike Leach up in Pullman, Washington at Washington State. Talk about that experience and especially helping Garner Minshew have a record-setting season. Uh, Yeah, really, really cool place. Uh, Pullman, Washington. It's the furthest Division I school from any other Division I school in the nation. Wow. So it's, it, it's kind of up there, the southeastern corner. I remember when I when I took the job with Coach Leach, I said, how do I get there? And he said, you got to fly into Spokane and rent a car and drive about an hour, 15 minutes south. I said, okay, that, that's great. So we go up there. Um, people, people always ask me of the different places you've lived, what's the place you've liked the most? Right. And I said, honestly, it's the place where we won the most games. <laughs> and uh, so Norman, Oklahoma, obviously, is one of them. But at Washington State, for us to win 11 games that year, uh, most in school history with Gardner Minshew, um, was really remarkable and really a cool experience and a cool school and a bunch of really good people and really good players. Uh, But the Gardner Minshew stories are are remarkable to me. He's from from Mississippi. Actually, he's the one who told us about Will Rogers. Uh, Washington State was Will Rogers' first offer. We were the first one to offer him. I actually went down there that spring and saw him. Uh, because he went to the same high school as Gardner Minshew. So Gardner, who's from Brandon High School, Mississippi, I think he goes to Troy for a year, goes to a junior college for a year, goes to East Carolina for a year, and he's playing there. And uh, and then East Carolina kind of told him, listen, we're, we hired a new OC. We're going to a, a kind of a zone read or whatever, but we're, we're bringing in a different quarterback, and we're going to try to go a different direction. He said, okay. Right. So I remember when we brought Gardner up to, uh, to Coach Leach, he said, he said, he's a good player. I kind of like him. He said, but we're going to take a player that East Carolina doesn't want. Is that, that's the best guy we can take. <laughs> and, uh, but you get around him and you talk to him and he came out and uh, he was, he was a sharp guy and a, a heck of a player really cared about the game. And um, it was really, really fun watching him. So he gets there in May, you know, coach Leach would always go May, June, July in Key West. So he, he was with us and didn't go through any spring football, showed up in the summer. Um, and we named him starting quarterback about a week before the first game. And uh, we're playing at Wyoming. Um, and I don't I don't know if we have a good team or not. I, I have no idea. I don't know who we're playing. I don't know a ton about the conference. So we're playing at Wyoming. The year before, Wyoming won 10. So we open up, altitude, whatever. Um, they have a 17 to 10 at halftime. 
We kick off to mm -hmm. Wyoming. They have a seven-minute drive and kick a field goal to wow. go up 20 to 10. And I remember saying, golly, we're, we're not going to have many more possessions in this game. So the next possession we get it, we get down to about the 35-yard line going in, and it's third and eight. And Coach Leach looks at Gardner Minshew, and he signals him a formation, and he pointed at him and goes, <laughs> and Gardner looked at him and, and did, and he looked in the huddle and he looked back at him and he goes, <laughs> and he didn't know what to do. <laughs> so finally, he called a play. Uh, he called something that didn't work. So on fourth and eight, we went for it and made it, and we went on a twenty-eight to nothing run. Wow! And ended up beating them, whatever. But I, I'll never forget looking at Gardner and watch him look at Coach Leach and just say, "What? Well, what do you want? What do you want me to do?" And uh, and Leach will go down as one of the, he he is he's one of the greatest coaches ever. Will be one of the greatest offensive coaches ever. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing the way he coached his quarterback and how he taught those guys to play and the number of quarterbacks that he coached that just set record after record uh, and watching his offense. But he was he was a neat guy to be around and, and very unique in every single way. But, yeah, Washington State, those those are some cool memories. Yes, sir. Those are two eccentric guys that you just kind of mentioned. Yep. What's, what's a funny, just kind of off-the-wall story about Garner Minshew? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> if we won a game, after the game, Gardner Minshew put on a headband aviator glasses and he walked around the locker room in his jock strap <laughs> wow and none of our players had ever seen a jock strap they didn't know what one was i mean and they, they couldn't figure out who is this guy they just couldn't figure him out so we're playing um it's like game six and it's year we won 11 and uh and we're five in and we may have been five and oh southern cal beat us on a on a we missed a field goal at the end of the game to tie the game. So I think we were 6-0. But we're playing Utah, a great team, Coach Whittingham. They come in, it's a close game, and we throw like a 65-yard touchdown pass in the fourth quarter and end up beating them. Um, and my parents came to that game. My family was there, and they came up. My, my father gets to about two games wherever I go. He goes to see my brother wherever he goes. So he was there for the game. So after the game, he's in the locker room walking around, and uh, – one of our safeties had an interception. He said, yeah, let me talk to that guy. Yeah, hey, great job, great play. Uh, one of our receivers, Aesop Winston, great player who caught the touchdown, dodged two guys, won the game. He said, yeah, Aesop, hey, Coach Berger, great, great game. Enjoyed watching you play. A, a really impressive game. Awesome. You guys got a chance to have a heck of a year. And he said, where's Gardner? Let me, let me holler Gardner real quick. So there goes Gardner turning the corner in his jock strap and his aviator glasses and his headband. <laughs> And he patted me on the shoulder. He said, you tell Gardner he had a good game. He left. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, great. But That's Gardner, great. he was. He, but he was competitive, and he cared, and he was the leader, and he, he was the type of guy you wanted to follow, and he, yes, he did. He made a huge difference in that team and that program for that year. So, Coach, I've got to ask you, you've coached in the SEC, you've coached in the Pac-12 and the Big 12. Outside of the SEC, what other conference compares to the SEC or is more like it? Is it the Pac-12 or the Big 12? I mean, who knows? Everything. Everybody's got their own opinions. Every year there's right. different years that are outstanding. Right. You know, I, I, right. it's hard for you to say one or the other. Uh, obviously, when they talk about the SEC and you talk about the yes. most players that go to the combine, the most players that are drafted, the most players that represent in the NFL – uh, they kind of define their own. Uh, but there's been teams that come and go. And, you know, then I'm, I have not been in the Big Ten, but but certainly they represent at a high level too. And, right. uh, you know, different teams will have different really great teams and great players each year. And, you know, watching what TCU did last year with Sonny Dykes was, yes. was pretty special. So uh, I, I've been fortunate to be at some neat places. And years I was at Oklahoma, we had a bunch of good players. And oh, yeah. the years after that, the amount of players that got drafted out of Oklahoma that – you know, Coach Duke played for four national championships. Yeah. Uh, he only won one. I was fortunate to be with him that that year. But he's he's had a lot of great players. Uh, you look at those K States and Texases, and then when I was there in Nebraska, and um, you know, I've, I've 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 been real fortunate to be in some really neat stadiums. You know, even in the Pac-12 to go to Washington, to go to Oregon, to go to Stanford, to go to Southern Cal, to go to UCLA, to play in those stadiums, and just the the rich history and, and the great players that have played there in the past is. Is really really cool. So I think every year, every team is different on their merits, and uh, we kind of go from there. And 
hopefully our conference up here, Tulsa. We, yeah. We've had two good two players draft in the first round in the last three years. Oh, so yeah. we, we've had some good players here, and, and hopefully yeah. we can continue to be a place that puts out some really good football players. Yes, sir. Coach, of all your stops, and I'm going to put words, words in your mouth. You can take them out if you'd like. Of all your stops, which stop did you like the least? And I'm going to guess Washington, D.C., and it's because of the traffic. <laughs> you know what? We, we didn't. We were never in Washington, D.C. Uh, we were in Ashburn, okay. Virginia. I mean, our, our okay. training camp, the only time we went to the stadium was to play. We never went near it. We, okay. I lived in Leesburg, Virginia, and it was beautiful up there. I actually loved it. Uh, we weren't in much traffic at all. Um, I, I can't identify a place that, um, that was a, a least like place. Uh, and I've, I've been fortunate to be in a bunch of really cool places. Uh, being a GA, Florida was awesome. But, uh, but yeah, I've, I've, I've been in a bunch of great places and, and learned a lot everywhere I've been and, and just really, really fortunate and blessed to be there. Good deal, Coach. Hey, a Coach, last season, we're going to talk about that very briefly. A crazy circumstance happened. Uh, you're there when you were in Starkville, the passing of Coach Mike Leach. And, and it was a horrible situation. Um, people are still mourning and will always mourn Coach Leach. He was very beloved by so many around the world. Uh, but with that, what is your favorite Coach Leach story that you can share with us? Yeah, there, there's too many. Uh, there really are. He's, uh, you know, he had some health issues during the year. He mm -hmm. was kind of stubborn in his ways. Uh, didn't take particularly great care of himself. You know, was up late. Didn't exercise very much. But he always kind of, he was him. And, he, you know, he, he didn't look awful. Uh, but, I mean, literally the, the, the Saturday he was, he was with us. We had a practice that day for two and a half hours. We had official visits all weekend. Uh, mm -hmm. He was with kids and their parents all night. We we had a dinner. We uh, we had a, a group of people afterwards, um, and then the next day he was gone. So it was uh, it was scary how how quick it came and how fast he he was just gone. And and I remember kind of defining him as as he's one in a million. And I remember somebody else saying, no no no, there's there's never been one like him, and there'll never be another one like right. him again. He he was one in one. He was one of one. Um, but yeah, so many just little neat conversations you have with him and. You always had to be careful asking him a question because he'd answer it in 45 minutes. Uh, if he ever called you on the phone, you couldn't, you couldn't get off the phone with him. Um, so it, it was, it was strange. There, there were a lot of. Uh, I mean, I, I, I got a thousand. I, I could go on and on and on. One, one of the better ones though that I do remember, and this was way back in the day. So, in 2000, when he got the head coaching job at Texas Tech, we're at the college coaches convention, and I believe it was like in San Antonio. It was in Texas. So me and a bunch of coaches. And actually, a couple of our graduate assistant coaches were with us in, in just in the convention center. And some guy came up to us who was a GA at another school. And he, and he looked over and he pointed at Coach Leach and he said, do any of you guys have any idea who that guy is? And he was wearing blue jeans. He was wearing a, a sweatshirt. He had coffee in one hand and a dip in the other hand. And he said, I can't get rid of this guy. I can't shake him. I can't. I, here I am trying to find a job. And I'm stuck with this guy all day. I we're like that guy's a head coach at Texas Tech. You may want to. <laughs> so that was that was a typical Mike Leach. You know, he never looked great. He never he talked to anyone. If anyone ever said hello to him, he'd get his number. He'd ask him where they were from. And uh, we used to be in staff rooms, and his phone would ring, and he'd get on his phone. And he'd start talking to people, and we'd stop the meeting. And, <laughs> I mean, a constant, nonstop. We'd we'd be watching tape, and the tape would stop, and we'd look back there, and he'd just be, he'd be on his phone. <laughs> we just wait for him to get done and we start watching tape again um you know we we game planned on mondays right um so monday was our day off he would watch tape with a ga most of the day and then when he was done the ga would text us and we'd come in a game plan on monday evenings and we would start anywhere between 8 p.m and 11 30 p.m wow and we didn't know. So we'd come in, we'd do our work. I usually went home and ate dinner with my kids, put all my kids to bed. And sometimes I'd go to sleep and then I'd get a text. All right, in 30 minutes, we're going to get started. So I think we had two last year that started about 11 and went to about two o'clock. And mm. then the rest of them normally started about eight or nine o'clock. But yeah, that's, that's just how we did it. That's how we rolled. Yes. <laughs> no concept of time, right? Yeah, none at all. And it was everything was on his schedule. But, but he was I a bet. neat guy. You know, you hear some of his stories and he'd always go to Key West and, uh, and, and yet you had to really pay attention to him to learn what made him special because the majority of what he said was kind of fluff. I and mean, the majority of what he said mm -hmm. was talking about this or that or TV or 
Yellowstone or something. Right. Uh, but but if you really, I mean, and you really had to listen when he coached players too, because he never taught a ton of just footwork and fundamentals. And I mean, it's still to the open guy. I mean, that was his number one. That was his number one coaching tactic, and it worked. It was pretty good. So he was uh, he was certainly a neat guy to be around. I, I was fortunate for the six years I got to be around him and, and, and learned a lot. And I, I'll never forget him. Did you ever see his place in Key West? I did. Uh, and it'd be what you'd expect. It was kind of quiet and small and calm. And you, you you had to go behind the house to find it off of Duval Street down there. And uh, Never spent a lot of money. Never cared about anyone's opinion of him or what he looked like or what he did. Or I mean, mm-hmm. but he loved Key West. He loved that little straightaway. He loved the three places he'd go. And yeah, neat place. Very so, cool. Coach Spurrier, you had a time there at South Carolina. And during that time, you were the offensive co- co-offensive coordinator and helped with Alshon Jeffrey and Pharaoh Cooper. Talk about both of those players and how dynamic they were. Yeah, I, I was very, very fortunate. South Carolina, we had a bunch of great ones. Uh, mm-hmm. I still claim Debo Samuel. Uh, I signed yes. Debo Samuel and coached him his first couple of years. Uh, Demir Bird played a long time. Sidney Rice was right. was an yeah. early draft pick. Um, I, I mean, I, I had five or six really, really, really talented wide receivers. Quarterback Connor Shaw, the best quarterback right. in school history, I think. Yep. Um, Alshon was a neat guy. Alshon, he was about 6'3". He was about 225. He was a big, big guy. Um, and he was kind of quiet and kind of calm and not very emotional. Uh, but worked harder than anybody I ever coached. And I'll never forget that. Like after practice every day, he wanted to work harder. He wanted to do something a little bit different. Um, but yeah, he he changed the game for us. Yes. He he was the guy that when you start talking about plays and offense and how the quarterback goes through his reads, you know, it's this guy, that guy. And if it doesn't look good, throw it to Alshon. Wherever Alshon is, throw it to him. This, 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 throw, throw it to Alshon someplace. Um, and he was that type of talent. Uh, the year we beat Alabama when they were number one in the nation, I think that was 2010. Yeah, uh, he played a great game. I think he had seven catches for 138 yards and two touchdowns, and 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 had one that he got knocked out on about the five yard line. So he was. Uh, I'm trying to think exactly what game it was. It wasn't that one. It was about two games before that we played Kentucky, and he started, and he had eight receptions in that game for 140 yards and two touchdowns, I believe. But the Alabama game was, and I think Stephen Garcia, our quarterback, completed about 15 of of 22 balls. Yes. Uh, Marcus Lattimore had a great game as, at running back, uh, but but Alshon Jeffrey was one of the one of the true difference makers in that game, and one of the true difference makers in college football that year as a wide receiver. So you just touched on it a little bit right there. The Alabama game in 2010. Please walk us through the excitement and the emotion of that game because you guys did knock off the number one team in Alabama that day. Yeah. Yeah. It had never happened before. I don't think it's happened since. Um, we knew we had a good team. Alabama mm-hmm. obviously was a great team. Uh, we had a good defense. Uh, so we, we knew we could come to play. Uh, my, my father could always present things in a way that, you know, if we play pretty good, we can beat these guys. Uh, and there, there was never a perception that this is the greatest team in the world. We're, we're, we're going to play our game and we're going to come to play and we're going to, we're, we're going to put a plan in place that allows us to beat these guys. And um, and if you ever talk to anyone that's that's played for my father, even some of the people back at Duke, which I always kind of admired, he said Coach Burger always he always taught and he always coached in a way that made us believe that we were better than we actually were. Yes. Mm-hmm. And we, we always we always felt that way. We always thought we were pretty good. We always thought we could play with anybody. And uh, going into that day, we we thought we had a chance. Um, and it was it was a fun game. We executed a lot of stuff well. Uh, Garcia played really well. Marcus Lattimore played really well. Defense played really well. But when the game's over and, you know, the clock hits 0-0 uh, and we'd won the game, it was uh, – I think it was 35-28. It was absolutely um, a, a feeling of, you know, we've done something that's that's never happened here before. We're we're part of a team, part of a staff, part of a program that uh, it, it, it's, it's pretty special. It's pretty unique. So that was that was cool. That, that was really, really neat. And, uh, we had we had a really good year that year. That was one of that stretch of years that we won uh, 11, three years in a row, uh, beat Clemson five years in a row. So that was uh, yeah, just a really cool, cool time to be a, a South Carolina Gamecock. So, Coach, briefly, you know, we all know that Gus Malzahn 
when he was at Auburn, when he would win a game, they would always go to the huddle house. So I've got to ask you, when you guys win a game, do you happen to have any kind of fun ritual that you do with your wife or your family to celebrate that win? Not necessarily. <laughs> Usually, uh, now Coach Leach after the game, win or lose, he got in his car and was gone. We never saw him anywhere. Uh, my mother and father always set up a big spread uh, in the office for all the staff and family. So we were always in there, and that was always really a, a, a neat time. At the University of Florida, we went to a bar called Napolitano's uh, down around the way. Um, but I do remember uh, – I do remember – in 1990, maybe 96, mm-hmm. uh, at Florida won the last championship. And I went home with uh, Coach Stoops. I drove home in his car, and we just beat Tennessee, uh, Peyton Manning, and they were a great team. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're driving down the road, and we're heading out to Napolitano's, and we were kind of at a red light. And some guy handed us a bunch of beers out of his car in our car. <laughs> we're driving down the road. <laughs> we, 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 we pulled in. Uh, uh, Napolitano. So those were special, special times. And uh, I, I do remember those. And yeah, I'm, but they always say you're, when you, when you win a big game, your, your, your days are sunnier, your, your wives are better looking, your, you know, everything you tastes better. Air is cleaner. Food, paper better, yeah, everything's, everything's good. So I've, I've been fortunate to be involved in, in a lot of good days and, and to have a really good looking wife. <laughs> and coach, <clears throat> growing up around the game, who was your first favorite player? I tell you what, this is a neat story, and it's unusual. I'm, I'm not sure how it happened, but, I mean, really, really young. I rem- Somehow my father went somewhere, and he brought back a bunch of Seattle Seahawks stuff. And it was okay. a sticker. It was a, it was a T-shirt. I don't know what it was. It was a hat. I don't, I don't know how it came from. So Jim Zorn and Steve Largent, and, I mean, it's yeah. the 70s. Uh, you know, Steve Largent went to Tulsa. Uh, okay. I actually, I went to I went to dinner with he and his wife a, a, a couple weeks ago. But I remember seeing his face on the wall here. I'm like Steve Largent went to Tulsa, one of one of my earliest heroes ever. Um, I thought was amazing, uh, really really, cool. really cool. But then after that, you go into your uh, your Jerry Rice's and, mm-hmm. and some of those people. Um, another story I love telling. My first year at Oklahoma, um, uh, ABC was doing the telecast, and Lynn Swan was doing the telecast. And Lynn Swan was one of my heroes. I mean, this yeah. guy was I – mean, he was one of the greatest I'd ever seen play the game. And uh, so I asked him, I said, will you, will you say a couple words to my receivers if you don't mind? He said, yeah, no problem. So he came over and, you know, and this Lynn Swan, you know, ABC doing the telecast, but really, really one of my favorite guys. And, and he, you know, gave his little motivation and this, that, or another. And, and as he left, I kind of looked around. My guys had a blank look in their face. I'm like, that, you guys know who he is, don't you? I never heard of him. I never, never heard of the guy. I know the 2000. Oh. This is a while back, while back. I, so I had to, so I had to do a little research and start bringing up some highlights. Of, but they had no idea who Lin Swan was. But yeah, he was a, he was another guy that that growing up, I remember watching play and win that I, I thought was kind of a, a remarkable player. That breaks my heart. They don't know who Lin Swan is. Yeah, it broke mine too. That's terrible. <laughs> So, uh, with that being said, we're going to throw it to break. We're going to wrap up this uh, okay. last segment. You're listening to Tide 100.9 here in Tuscaloosa. And all you SEC fans, stick around. Steve Spurrier, joiner, will uh, be with us right after the break. of Tuscaloosa and Northport. The summertime is here and that means the college students have left for the summer. So now it's time for you guys to venture out and try Tuscaloosa's newest coffee shop, Strange Brew on the Strip. Now the temperatures are getting warmer outside so they have a bunch of frozen drinks such as frappes, bushwhacker, 
frozen hot chocolates, smoothies, as well as gelato and ice cream for all of your cooling off needs this summer. You can find them at 1101 University Boulevard right there on the strip at the University of Alabama. You can also follow them at Strange Brew Bama on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter for all of the latest information about Strange Brew Coffee House. Go by and see them today and tell them the Stingray Show sent you. Welcome back, Tuscaloosa. You're listening to the Stingray Show here on Todd 100.9 uh, ESPN Radio. we got Steve Spurrier Jr. with us. He is now at the University of Tulsa, uh, coaching there, the quarterbacks. And uh, Coach Spurrier, I was going to ask you a father question since we're approaching Father's Day. Yeah. What is Father's Day like at your household? It's it's a pretty full day. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of activities going on. So uh, certainly we normally go to church. We have a pretty good lunch somewhere. We typically watch the, the U.S. Open. We watch the kind of the end of that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, now again, anytime you got a special family and a special wife and special kids, and uh, there, there's certainly a lot to celebrate. And um, and then I, I get a chance to get on the phone with my father and talk to him. And uh, I'm, I'm very thankful and appreciative of, of everything my father's meant to me. Um, and it's funny because as, as a when Father's Day approaches, I think a lot more about my father than I do how my children might might perceive me. So, right. um, but that, that, that's a good day. It's a big day it's once a year, and it's um, it is a neat day to to recognize uh, the father in your life and uh, and how special and what he's meant to you. So, seven gifts, or does the wife take care of all of them? Um, she takes care of most of them. I take care okay. of a few of them, but between the two of them, we get it done. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're they're old enough now they can help take care of the other ones so that helps too. So so now I'm going to reverse the question on you. What's Mother's Day like? Are, are you put to the task on that? A little bit, but but again, it's it's another special day, and you know I don't think either one of us go out of our way to make it a wonderful day for someone and a harder day for the other one. It's um it's a celebration. Mother's Day and Father's Day are probably pretty similar. On um, we're thankful, appreciative. Uh, everyone's happy, healthy, eats well, sleeps well. And uh, we can celebrate another day of, of what that person has meant to our family. I'll slip this in. We had Emily Beamer on the show. We had her for our Mother's Day show. Yeah. And um, you talked about, she talked about going to church and everything like that. And I was going to ask you about that. Is it one of those things that you guys slip in five minutes late and, you know, you duck out the door? Or is it one of those things where you actually get to get in and enjoy worship? Is it a smaller church or is it something where people are just bombarding you with football questions afterwards? No, it's, uh, it's in the middle. No, we, uh, okay. we get there and again, I'm, I'm not the head coach. So Beamer probably gets a little bit more attention than I do. Uh, <laughs> my father, who's, you know, the son of a Presbyterian minister, right. And he was kind of a get in and get out guy. And he didn't, he, he didn't, he didn't hang around very long. Uh, but, but my father was always, my father has a really unique faith that you, and you never hear him talk about. And, you know, he would always say, God, God smiled on the, on the Gators. God smiled on the Gamecocks today. Uh, right. But, but really knowledgeable, really, he's got a deep, he's got a, he's another guy's deep faith. You have to really listen to him to realize how deep it is. And mm. I was fortunate to grow up in that as well. But yeah, my family and who I am, yeah, nobody bothers me much. Well, it takes us a while to get there and drop kids off at all the different little spots. For the, <laughs> uh, that, that, that's, that's the hardest part. Of that. for, yeah. That's, that's oh, the, yeah, the Sunday four, school. Right? I wouldn't yeah. know what to do with seven. Yeah, it, it, it requires a little bit greater effort. Uh, but yeah, no, go to a really good church, really good music, and um, yeah, fortunate to have a and make sure we instill in our kids uh, the, the the strength and what it means to have a, a solid faith. Well, Coach Furrier, I've got two questions left for you, and then we will get out of here. The first one is: You coached with who is now the head coach there at USC. Talk about your re your interaction and experience coaching with Lincoln Riley there at Oklahoma. Yeah, Lincoln. Lincoln is a remarkably sharp guy, mm -hmm. uh, and a, and a hell of a guy to be around. I, I was with him one year there. I'd known him a little bit when he was at East Carolina. We'd cross paths a few times, uh, but my but when uh, Coach Stoops hired me, I think it was 2014. Right. Uh, I was an analyst there, and. Um, and I remember, you know, I'm an offensive analyst with with Lincoln, and uh, and I asked him, I said, "What do you what do you want me to do? I mean, what can I?" He said, "Not much." And he gave me a few things that I kind of did each week, but not a lot. And finally, I said, "Well, what do you not want me to do? I just don't want to be in the way." And uh, <laughs> I said, "Can I meet with you?" And he said, "Yeah." So I met with Lincoln Riley, Baker Mayfield, and Kyler Murray every day for a year. 
Wow. And, wow. and I kind of just sat and yeah, it's kind of a lot of money on the table right now. And, <laughs> um, but I, I thought the interaction of all of them was really, really neat and really unique. And, and I, and it was kind of fun watching because Lincoln would challenge them in ways that I was curious to see if they understood it. You know, he'd talk about fronts and if this guy bumps over here and if we move the back and the shade turns into three, we're going to get to this running play. And I'd always, and, and I was always amazed how sharp uh, Baker and Kyler were. Uh, both of them very, very intelligent football players. Both of them extremely talented, extremely competitive. Um, so that that was kind of a neat year to be around those guys. But yeah, Lincoln's a sharp dude, a hardworking guy. Uh, he'll be a successful guy. And, and again, I've, he's one of the few guys I've ever met. I mean, his extreme between yelling and screaming at guys and loving them up in the same day yes. was a really, really, really a unique skill he has. And he always yeah. ended the day on a positive note. And he was he would be critical, guys. He was critical. Um, but he always moved forward and and stayed positive and, and continued to, to press things in the right direction. And he was he was a really cool guy to be around, without a doubt. And, Coach, my final question for you is simply this. Based off what you saw this spring, could you please give us a breakdown of how you think the Tulsa Hurricanes are going to be this season? Yeah, what are the Golden Hurricanes going to look like? The Golden Hurricanes. First of all, if y'all can do some research and tell me why the Golden Hurricanes are in Tulsa, Oklahoma, we're still trying to figure that out exactly. Right. Uh, there's <laughs> <laughs> we used to be the tornadoes. There's a long list, of all that, but the Golden Hurricanes. I think we're going to have a pretty good team. Um, you know, we lost a couple guys in the transfer portal. Auburn took a couple of our offensive linemen. Our, our quarterback Braylon Braxton coming back. I think is a really talented young man, and he's got a chance to really have a good year. Uh, there's still some pieces on on exactly where we fit. Uh, there's still some understanding of exactly who our conference is and who we play. You know, I, I don't know all the answers on that, uh, but I think Ke Coach Wilson, Kevin Wilson, is a sharp guy, tough guy. Uh, we'll have a team that comes ready to play, uh, and we'll, we'll put up a good fight every week. So I'd like to think we're going to win more than we lose. And uh, to me, that would be a pretty successful season here in year one in Tulsa. Yes, sir. Coach, I just thought about this. The the post-game bowl uh, fiasco a couple of years ago with State and Tulsa. Uh, has there been any jokes and, and rubbing elbow stories about that one? Not too many jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, and I, I, I kind of try to duck that question since yeah. I coached the receiver that was part of one of the main the leg right. swingers in the game. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that that was uh, – yeah, there's not many people that are really happy about that here. No. <laughs> um, and when I was there, you know, I'm in the press box, and I'm – Right. You know, I remember Tulu Griffin made a heck of a touchdown grab in that game too. It was, it was a heck of a win. Tulsa had a really, really good team that year. But I'm in the press box, and, and we're leaving. So I'm coming down, and I'm shaking hands. And by the time I got onto the field, every I, I, I didn't know what had happened at all. And then you look back and saw it. So, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a really good Tulsa team. It was, it was a good win for Mississippi State. Um, yeah, that's all I care to talk about that. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's fun. Well, yeah. Coach, this is my last question. It's a two-part question, but it goes back to Father's Day. What is something that your dad always taught you growing up that you still think about and so grateful that he did? And what's something that you always told your kids and players? You know, I always tell my kids and my players, I coach uh, a couple of little teams here in town, you know, and I always say you do good things, good things happen. You practice hard, it will pay off. You've got to concentrate. But what's something that you tell your kids and your players the same thing? And what's something that your dad told you that you still use to this day? Yeah, that, that's a long list, too. I mean, I still have his list of guidelines for a good football coach and, and, and all the things, all the winners and losers. You know, what, what do winners lose? What do, what do losers do? Uh, very clear on all those things. Um, yeah, I, I still have a lot of those that my kids and and my players. Yeah, that that's usually a similar message. Uh, but but be tough. Uh, well, hard work, hard work, and anything you do, nothing's ever achieved in life without hard work. Mm -hmm. um, and just such a long list of uh, of discipline and, and where you go and what you do and what you achieve. And you know, success is never ending. Uh, every day you have to you have to continue to pursue and achieve at a higher level. And and that was always a neat message coming from my father, who always achieved at a high level. Yes. And 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 right. again, and, and that's one thing. If you ever, you know, the the longer you live, the the more you 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 study people that were elite and what they did. Mm -hmm. And all of them were always hungry. And all of them yeah. were always. I mean, when I, I'll never. I, I still tell about the that Jordan, uh, the Netflix series on Jordan that came out, and he was always mad. I mean, he was mad yeah. when they won. They won the championship, and he was upset. He said, "You know, Carl Malone won won the MVP that year. I thought I should have won it." 
They just, they just won the <laughs> world championship, and, he's, and he was upset. And uh, and everything he ever did, he always he always pursued more than what he had. And and I think the best always have that. So as a coach, as a father, as a parent, just always continue. I have always uh, pressed guys to to achieve more and set higher goals. And um, don't don't ever let your memories uh, be greater than your dreams. And uh, to me, that mm. was that that was always a hard one to overachieve because my memories, I have a lot of wonderful memories, right. a lot of wonderful memories, but Absolutely. don't but always, always make sure your dreams are greater than your memories. So that's always something you, you, you kind of strive to press um, as a father and a football coach. Yes, sir. I'm so glad you shared that. Coach, that should be on a poster. Man, that's a pretty good one. I forget where I, I where that one first came out, but that, that's always a, a solid one. I like it a lot. Loved it. Coach, thank you so much for joining us. You bet. Is there anything you'd like to say before you head out? Happy Father's Day, and then whatever my, my message is for the, the Happy Stingray Show rolls full speed. Hail State, I still love all my Hail Staters. Yeah. Tulsa Hurricane here, go Gators, go Gamecocks. Can't say go Redskins anymore, go Commanders. All, all the places I've been. Go Cougars, Washington State. Yeah, I've, I've been fortunate to be a lot of great places and have a lot of great memories and um, and, and hope to continue them here in Tulsa. Yes, sir. Thank all you. All right, thanks so much, man. Have a great day. You too. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Glad to see you all. all right. All right. Well, man, that was an awesome interview there. Uh, Father's Day special with uh, Steve Spurrier Jr. We really do. The father of seven children, Steve yes, Spurrier Jr. We really do want to thank him for joining us. And Heath, I got to tell you what, we went a little bit everywhere, didn't we? Yeah, you know, it, it was fun to, to, to talk to Coach Spurrier. You know, uh, I hope his offense is as fast as he talks. It was great. Uh, uh, of him zigzagging here and there, dropping names and stories and everything. Right. I mean, you know, we had Steve Largent, uh, uh, Chris Zorn. He talked about, um, you know, Riley right. there at USC. We talked about Garner Minshew. We talked about Will Rogers in high school. Uh, you know, we talked about Steve Spurrier. We I mean, we talked about Jerry Rice. We talked. There's a lot of names. We talked about Mike Leach. Yes. A lot of coaches, a lot of players, a lot of fun people dropped in that interview. If you missed any of it, Definitely check out the podcast. That will be one that you probably want to listen to at least twice. Yeah. So, guys, that's going to do it for this edition of the Stingray Show. And I do want to apologize for the background noise as there was a nasty thunderstorm that went over my location during the time of this interview. So I do want to apologize for all of the booming in the background, that was thunder. Uh, but, dude, that was a fun show nonetheless. Absolutely. You know, and, hey, to all the fathers out there, to the great-grandfathers, the grandfathers, the dads, the one-day-will-be dads, you know, hey, thank you for all what you do. Yes. You know, if you ever do any kind of research, and I do encourage you just to spend just a couple of minutes one day, to, to look at the research about the stats on fathers yep. and what they mean in, in your children's life and everything, it's a massive role. There's so many things your children take just from the father, not from the mother. And so it's not an absent job. And, you know, um, for the deadbeats that are out there, I'm sure you won't admit to it. Um, but if you do hear this and you think you can do a little more, just research it. Your kids always want to spend time with you, and it doesn't matter how old they are. I don't care if your father's in his 80s and you're in your 50s. Your kids still want to spend time with you. Yes. And so with that being said, I wish all the great fathers out there, I challenge you to get out there and just research on Google, you know, father's uh, statistics. And just read a couple of those articles and things that pop up. It will absolutely blow your mind of what children get from their fathers. It's a massive role. And with that being said, and in some parts, in some parts, David, I'm not putting down the moms. You know, but households that have just fathers, the, the children perform at a higher level when it's just mothers. And it's sad that we have to say that. Um, we never want a household to have without the other. But, hey, fathers, huge role. And happy Father's Day to all of you guys. Expand your role. Take pride in your role. Amen. All right, man. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of the Stingray Show. Like I said, we hope that you guys have thoroughly enjoyed it with Steve Spurrier Jr. Make sure you tune in tomorrow evening for another show with Tom Luganville, who will be our guest on the Thursday edition of the Stingray Show. And guys, we are going to send it out with our legendary 
thing that we always do he we, we are out. out see you guys tomorrow night six o'clock right after ryan fowler right here on time 100.9 Woo! Chicken bake.